All right, so continuing along, so you get the, the gist of how to use this fear and avoidance hierarchy. Yeah, let, let me tell you another story from many years ago. Uh, and actually, unfortunately, it's a story that has repeated itself with many of the kids I've worked with, where a parent called me. She had a nine-year-old child who uh, had been in therapy, had been ongoing therapy since she was about six, seven for anxiety concerns, mainly separation type stuff and some worry. And she had been in therapy all along. It, she was nine going on 10, and it was time for her to go to summer camp. All her friends were at the sleepaway camp for a couple of weeks. And uh, the child was not wanting to go. And, and actually, by this point, not only had she been in therapy, but they added in medication. Um, and so what happened is the mom called me late April to get the child. We heard, you know, the psychiatrist told us to call you, that you could do this cognitive behavioral therapy to get her off to camp in June. I'm like, oh boy, okay. So, you know, they came in and sure, we worked and worked and worked, you know, once a week, but still we worked and sure enough she went off to camp. But I said to the mom, you know, make sure she returns. I need really to work with her some more after camp's done. Didn't hear from him. The child then, when she was around 12 going on 13, the mother called me again. Now she's having panic attacks and not wanting to go to school and stuff. And she said, the therapist, who she's been working with since she was six, said, why don't you call Albano again and see if she could get rid of these panic attacks? <laughs> like they were getting in the way of his treatment. Aww. Okay? And so I said to the mom, what are the goals of that treatment? Um, well, she says, I mean, honestly, she's like, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, to help her self-esteem. I said, oh, okay. Do you know what happens in session? No. Uh, she likes to go. Uh, I think they color sometimes. And I don't know. I, you know, and <laughs> my stomach, you know, and I couldn't help it. I said, listen. What are, what's her self-esteem going to be like when she's 30 and looks back on a childhood spent in therapy that doesn't seem to have an end? And who knows what's going on and what the purpose of that therapy is? I think it is very, very important that children know why they are working with you and I am all for the boundaries and confidentiality for adolescents, but there still needs to be parental involvement, especially around the goals and the objectives of treatment and, and giving some information back to the therapist as they evaluate progress. Progress needs to be evaluated along the way. Otherwise, you wind up with kids like, this poor kid who had been spinning her wheels and no one knew why. And she actually wasn't getting better. And that, I think, is very sad. I don't think kids should spend their childhoods in therapy if there's a way that they can learn skills, adapt, and move on. And maybe they come back, and our kids come back periodically. I actually love the, the, the young adults that I've worked with from the time they were kids, you know, periodically who text me from college, hey, guess what, I got Phi Beta Kappa, or guess what, I'm going on, uh, you know, the Peace Corps thing, is there all kinds of stuff. It makes me very happy that, you know, we have this kind of prescriptive model that everyone knows why they're there, there's a purpose, there's goals, we celebrate them as they meet them, and these fear and avoidance hierarchies, these hierarchies of goals and targets are so important because it gives it gives the kids re, you know, an understanding of why they are there and what they're working towards, and the same thing with the parents. And if you're not moving along, it helps you then to step back and say, okay, what else we have to do here? Wait, you know, we've got to figure this out. And you do a little more assessment to figure out what's going on uh, and why this isn't working. Maybe they're not following through and we get it, you know, what gets in the way of following through. But it's always, it's an iterative process of the therapist, the parent, and the child, you know, all working together and evaluating 
how things are progressing. So that is my bias and, very, you know, I'm not, you know, bashing other treatments, but in cognitive behavior therapy, we would not do treatment without ongoing assessment. Okay, I'm bashing other treatments. In cognitive behavior <laughs> therapy, we do, you know, it's very important. I'm a, you know, it's very important that we evaluate these kids' outcomes for them, not for research, for them. Reitman. Assessment is, uh, is, is emphasized here. A couple questions for you. Number one, to what extent does, since we are talking about schools, and I always try to remind my students about the school's primary mission, which is you know, educating kids, to what extent does academic assessment sort of come into play in your assessment? And then the second question I have is, uh, since uh, insurance companies are often very reticent to pay, for assessment, I wonder how it is that you know these, this is a fairly expensive assessment. Seems like it involves many, many hours of uh, of, of assessment, and, and who pays for it? Yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, first of all, let me let me start with this. This is why you don't have to do the full diagnostic evaluation that we give, but you have on your shelf something that show, tells you how to evaluate or what questions to ask for the different functions. And so that's what I, a one hour assessment can give you the targets of treatment. And then this particular hierarchy serves from the, you know, it's, it's part of your first session with the kids to develop it and their parents, and it serves as the main assessment going forward. So that's why I say the first week you're doing a little more work because you're photocopying 30 copies of it, so you hand one out to mom, one out to the child, okay? All right, and you know, on occasion, send one to the teacher, right? With permission to see how the teacher thinks the child's doing with things. Because we'll also have things on the hierarchy, asks a question in class, interacts with other students uh, in, a, you know, in a positive way. You know, you could put every kind of thing, has gone into the cafeteria, um, made mistakes, and, did, and, and handled that appropriately. There's all kinds of things that could go on to these hierarchies that make it very individualized to that child that are the key things they're suffering with. And over the course of time, it's a piece of paper from your copy machine, right? So with, and I'll tell you about some, we're gonna go very quickly through self-report measures that you can also download from the web and use. But the thing David also brought up here is I always, when it comes to kids who are school refusers, I want to see the last years of school or in the last year's educational records. I want to see their grades. I want to see, uh, like, s some schools give narratives from the teachers. We'll do a little narrative summary of how the child is in the English class, the science class, and so forth. I want to get a good sense of what their functioning was academically because, you know, there may well be issues of learning disability and th different things that may have been getting in the way, and especially the more they're out of school, the less likely that gets attended to, could go underground. So we might have to ask for if they haven't had testing done uh, by the school or by a private psychologist who does, or an educational person who does testing, we might need that because there needs to be, especially the longer they're out, remediation, and then also we have to have rehabilitation of any kind of LD issue. So these go hand in hand too, you know. So every, I ask parents, come with a suitcase filled of whatever you can bring me that tells me about your child's functioning up to, you know, and, and to the point that they left, and then also whatever reports from a tutor, or blah, 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 you know, we want to see that, all right? And you're gonna plan accordingly with that you know, it's a lot of times we've had families who have, they don't know how to advocate the parents for their kids in the school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for getting testing done, getting you know, resource room, get, you know, and things along those lines. There's actually a crazy thing with some schools that we have up north, the private schools, where they, they make the family sign a pledge of no tutoring. Now, you have a child, and especially in these high-powered private schools, who, you know, has a bit of an LD or, or has an LD in math, you know, reading comprehension, whatever it might be, how can you do that? What is the reason for that? Uh, they want to they have the appearance in the private schools. What is the reason is the question of, you know, everybody being equal and, you know, it, 
the kids are graduating on the merits of the academics of the school. Well, the truth be is that they, the, the families up there don't tell the school about the, the tutors, and they don't tell each other about the tutors because having a, a good tutor for some of these private school kids, you, you find the tutor of your dreams. They want to hold these tutors. These tutors stay with these families. Let me drop a number on you. One child between eighth grade and beginning of 12th grade, $200,000 to the tutor. No kidding. Tutoring in New York City, $500 an hour for the top tutors. Click, everybody's moving to New York, yay! <laughs> Can you imagine? So anyway, I see David Reitman's in the back seat figuring out how much he can make <laughs> tutoring kids. They're paying $500 an hour for a tutor. I guess they ain't worried about paying for your rinky-dink little... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, is that oh, look, well, look, look, in our Midtown Clinic, next time you're in New York, you got to visit. In our Midtown Clinic, which is near Columbus Circle, if you know New York, uh, that's, I mean, I don't want to tell you, our real estate is high. Uh, so we actually, we don't take insurance in my clinic, in the, it's a Columbia University clinic, there's no insurance. We have a sliding scale, which is uh, the non-licensed staff can be a sliding scale. It isn't sliding the way that you would want it to slide. We, um, we do fundraising so we can offer scholarships to families who can't afford. But then, you know, we, we also, I supervise at, uh, clinics that take insurance and Medicaid through the hospital, too, and stuff. But it's, uh, you know, New York is a, New York's different. <laughs> you know, it's another world. <laughs> anyway, so other self-report measures you may want to use. Um, there's, I mean, and they're available on the web from, uh, you know, different people who, Actually, here's the fun thing. The school refusal assessment scale is, is in our manual that Chris Carney and I have. It's in cr other books of Chris Carney's. I put it into the web, school refusal assessment scales. Somebody had scanned it in. That's why you have it, because I was able to download it from someone's website. So if you put the names of some of these in negative affect self-statement questionnaire, that gets at the way a child internally speaks to themselves. That's Phil Kendall from Temple University. Here, uh, the children's depression inventory. Okay, I've got to ask the people at FIU to edit out of the tape what I'm about to say. <laughs> the Beck scales, the Beck anxiety inventory, the Beck depression inventory and stuff, they're all copyrighted now. The children's depression inventory, you Google this and get an old copy of it from before it was revamped. It correlates perfectly with the copyright paid version, okay? All right, the end of the editing. <laughs> uh, the state, and you know, many of these scales are available online. Others, you do have to go to like multi-health systems and stuff. This is just if you want to get extra information that might be helpful to you about Things. I would say the child behavior checklist, for example, and the youth self-report gives you broadband and then some uh, narrow band scales. Um, there's also, um, you know, different problem inventories that you can find on the web. But this is supplemental to you, right? It's supplemental. It's, it's more of your clinical interview and then honing in on, uh, you know, the hierarchy that's going to be fundamental to this treatment. And then, um, and there are parent-teacher measures, obviously, the parent Connors family environment scale. Depends. There are parent rating scales of anxiety in their child. The multidimensional anxiety scale has a parent version. Depends if you want to use these things. Again, it is a cost issue and time. Parents, of course, I make them sit in the waiting room and do a lot of, like, I have my own. I develop background history questionnaire for our clinic, so I make them fill out and write. They're not just going to sit there and read you know, popular books or whatever. Um, a big thing for us is observing. When I have a new family come in, and, and let, me, let me say, you know, I'm, I'm giving New York such a bad name. When I first moved back to New York in 98, 
and I was uh, given uh, my first patient, you know, and I called the mom, seven-year-old child with ADHD. I called the mother to arrange a session, you know, arrange for them to come in. And we talked about her son for a few minutes and da-da-da. And at the end of the call, I said, okay, Monday, 5 o'clock, and she says, great. When he's done with the session, please walk him out to the car. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, whoa. No, I need you and his father to come in with him. Oh, you do? Well, he has been seeing someone. He knows how to do this. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's lovely. I need you and the father to come in. So anyhow, you know, behavioral observation begins on the phone, right? It really begins. And then the thing I like to do is I walk, especially because, you know, I'm loaded with anxiety is my, my caseload is anxiety. I like to walk out to the waiting room, and there you have a mom and a dad and a child sitting in between. And I'm like, oh, Sandy, it's so nice to meet you and to meet your mom and dad. Um, I'm tell I, we're going to work together today, so come. Where I'm going to want to hear from mom and dad, and also from you. So you come with me now. And this is the behavioral test we call this: a behavioral approach avoidance test. Bad. All of a sudden, the mother, the Sandy's looking at me. Okay, she starts to get up, and mom's like, <gasps> she has separation anxiety. She can't leave me. <laughs> I'm going to have to be there with her. Oh boy. Okay, right there. Right there, you start to see dynamics, you know, playing out in front of you. I do use the D word. I'm sorry, David. I use that word every once in a while. I mean it in a behavioral way. So you get to see it. Are they not wanting to move? What's going on? You know, you, and there's different things that you can ask during the course of any assessment that you're doing or observation that you're doing. Um, you know, you ask the parents when, you know, about these things. Maybe they can record some of these things at home. It also might help the parent when you teach them, listen, we want you in the morning just to watch and one of you to take notes and the other one to be the parent who tries to get the child to move. I want you to record uh, what happens. Is the child crying? Is there any, are they complaining about any physical symptoms? Uh, what are they saying? Write it down for me. And what is the parent who's trying to get him in? Write that down for me. You know, um, uh, things like that that you could do. Whenever we can, I like to go to the home. And that is a tough thing, I know, with insurance reimbursement and stuff. But I got to tell you the story of a child from, that I will never forget, 12-year-old school refuser. Uh, he had a history of separation anxiety and GAD and migraines. Um, and this child, um, was brought in. He stopped going to school. This was sixth grade. He stopped going to school in, uh, right after Thanksgiving break. So they brought him in to me, fortunately, like right around February, beginning of February. And what happened was I'm sitting in my office. There's a new intake. I'm waiting for the family to come. And all of a sudden, the secretary runs in. She says, Amory, there's something going on. Come out, come out. And I go out to the waiting room. And there is a woman standing there. Oh, 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 please, help us, help us. I'm not kidding. This is at Barlow's clinic. She grabs my hand, and she takes me out the front door. I'm like, what the heck? And there's a man standing by a van. The back door of the van is open, and he's standing there. Hurry, hurry. I'm like, what the hell? Am I, am I being abducted? What's going on here? You know, I get to the door, and there is this kid laid out on the back seat and laying there. And the, the parents say, he's having a seizure. Like, you came to the wrong place. <laughs> PhD does not, I have no, so I'm like, oh my God. So I, you know, I'm, so I, I really was at a loss. So I got in the van and I looked at Bonnie, who is our secretary, and I'm just like, just hold it a second. I put my finger, two fingers under the kid's hand and I said, if you can hear me, squeeze my fingers. He squ and I'm like, all right, this is no seizure, baby. All right. So this was our first session, OK? It was in the van with the school refuser. And I sent mom and dad off to do the questionnaires and stuff. And you know, it was the first session with this kid. What, as time, you know, what happened is when we got to the point with the treatment where it was like, OK, you're, you're going to go to school this morning. And I told the parents, call me. And of course, I was ready at 6.30 in the morning because they called. He wasn't getting out of bed. I went to the house. So such great information to see. 
go into the house um, and go up to his room. And there's a sign on the door, do not disturb. <laughs> da, da, da. This is the haven of. And mom and dad are standing there with me. I open the door. The room is all dark except for glowing little lights. Enya is playing on the stereo. OK. There's along one wall is a turtle tank, the gerbil tank, and the fish tank. I'm like, oh my God. I flip on the light, at which point mom's like, oh. OK. It's like, you know, because he had had a history of headaches. So she's been conditioned to worry about his migraines, which seem to me on the monitoring sheets occur every morning before school, but are gone by the time the bus leaves, right? So I go over to his bed, and he's under his covers, and I yank him off. I don't recommend doing that to pubertal boys, but I took a chance. <laughs> Yanked him off. And at which point he's like, oh, I said, let's go. And what I was doing in this was modeling for the parents. And I'm like, let's go. Come on. I said, sit up. Hang those feet over the bed. You know, and I walked him over. I said, do you need to take a shower this morning, or are you just going to get dressed, brush your teeth, and get dressed? I need a shower. OK, great. Let's go to the bathroom. Threw him in the bathroom, shut the door. And I said, you got 10 minutes. I said to the parents, let's go have coffee. We went downstairs. Um, the father was just like, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> what I noticed downstairs, which was very interesting, they had this big house, yard, and stuff. They had in the backyard every piece of playground equipment, including uh, you know, a, a house, treehouse thing, and a little go-kart area. I'm like, oh boy. And in their family room was every computer set up, big screen TV thing and all. And what the, the parents, the father explained to me was they kept buying stuff to keep kids coming over. What's the reinforcer, you know, length, the lifespan of a reinforcer for a child, right? They run their, so they kept buying to entice other kids, but kids were gone. Ten minutes, come on, get out. The shower keeps going. I look at the father, shut off the hot water. He's like, yeah. He goes downstairs, he shuts off the hot water. See, they had to, you know, and the kid came out of the shower. I'm like, let's go. I said, you know, you're running late. You don't have time for breakfast here. Mom, give me the cereal bar. She's looking. I said, give me the cereal bar. <laughs> Threw them in my car, and we went, to, we went to school. They had to see you move it along and stop the over-parenting and, you know, over-protection stuff. He didn't complain of a headache. He was fine. You know, I said, change that Enya to some ACDC, baby. You know, we need to get this kid going in the morning. Yes? When you refer to certain changes in um, internal and external behavior, what internal behavior are you referring to? I'm sorry? When you refer to sudden changes in internal oh, and external, affect internal behavior. Internal behavior is that, you know, we go from wimping to angry. You know, it's the affect dysregulation and switches from I'm crying one second, mommy, and next minute I'm laughing, you know, things like that. And then the external behavior, of course, is acting out versus compliance and stuff. So the point being that if you can get any look at what is going on, um, this again is why God gave us undergraduates. We train them and send them as observation. <laughs> they do observations in the schools for us. Uh, they could go to people's homes, and you don't, you, know, you don't have to bill for them if it's not something that's billable. So if you have any way of setting up for your clinics the way you work, that you have some people who are like interns and stuff, students are always looking for ways you know, to work in psychology and social work settings. You, know, you can send them out where you don't have to bill or bill you know, not, you know, minimally um, to do some observation at home or school. Well, will won't have the luxury of having graduate students, I said as wonderful though they are. Uh, to what extent do you enjoy, uh, you know, things like this? How parents oh, yes. a little video, what's going on Parents at home? love do do bringing all? videos in. Par you know who loves bringing videos in? Parents of children with selective mutism. And you see their kid is singing like Madonna at halftime and they won't talk to you. So yeah, we, uh, using, using those, uh, this is great now to, Upload to you know me 
I'll give you my email, the videotape, or just bring it in and we'll play it. Uh, that's another good thing. And that's an old behavioral strategy. The thing that you could do is say, I'd like you to record um, the morning routine. And the first couple, and I want you to do it for the full week. The first couple of days, you might ignore it because they know the, that the tape's playing, so to speak. But then by Wednesday, you've got really what's going on. You've got a, you know, that kid is real, you, you get the real thing of the way the parents and the kids, so you hear the cursing at them and you hear the, ki you know, everything on it. So definitely do that. Behavioral observation, any way you can get at it. I mean, even making up things like, okay, look, thank you for coming in. I know, you know, we've agreed school refusal is the problem. You know, it is only 11 o'clock. So what I'm going to ask now is if you'll come with me, I'll take you to school. <laughs> that gives you a, right there a behavioral test. How are each of the players reacting to that? Um, and you could say, okay, I was testing to see what, what would go on. The big thing with behavioral assessment is we want to know what are they thinking as much as possible. And a lot of times you can hand the child a piece of paper. I just told you I'm going to take you to school. Write down for me what is going through your mind. And mom, dad, you write it down what you're thinking. You're getting thought listings of what they say to themselves at the thought of going to school. Okay? Now, I've told you I'm going to take you to school. How would you all solve this? What do you think about? Then watch them interact around, ah, uh, yeah, she really, she can't really take me. They won't let her take me, you know. And the parents, watch how that goes. <coughs> Is there coercion? Is there threat? Uh, is the child amping it up that, fine, I'm going to jump out of the car on the way? You know, what are the things that is happening between the kids and the parents right in front of you? Because, again, it gives you more stuff to understand how this goes at home and why maybe parents throw their hands up and, and all. So these are different things that we want to see in terms of behavioral observation. And, again, it's this all like within sessions one and two as you're moving along coupled with as you start doing the treatments as you move along. The school refusal assessment scale should be in your packet. At, is it in the back of your packet? Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's a parent form with the P, and then there's the child form with the C. You, it's 24 items. You ask them to score it. I mean, I mean, to fill it out separately again. And I give one to mom, one to dad, one to the child. Um, and then there's instructions for scoring it to see what the highest function is. So the four functions are covered in the 24 questions. And then you pull out it, their scoring um, instructions. And the highest function is the one that you're going to be prescriptively applying a treatment to. One question for two situations. One is the videotaping, which I think is wonderful data. Um, how old is the child that you tell the child and don't tell the child? That's a very tricky situation that you think your baby, some of them may have a regulation and a stop and break an iPhone or something. Um, and the other one is that scale, what age is that? Um, oh, the school <coughs> report. Yeah, as a self report, let me start with the easier one. As a self-report, the school refusal scale to how, uh, however young the child can read, but it's typically seven and older. That's, and it's written that way. But, you know, again, be, bear in mind learning issues and things like that. I don't know if there are translated copies yet, but if you go to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, Chris Carney, K-E-A-R-N-E-Y, he might on his website have, translate, have some translated for Spanish. Have to see. Um, and then the other question about informing the child whether you're going to tape record them or not. Um, I would say yes, if it's something you're setting up. I would say I'm going to ask your parents to just uh, record what's going on with this uh, so that they know. I don't like to do things behind the kids, you know, back in that way. Um, so I would say yes, all right? And I think, again, you'll get the true behavior as it starts presenting itself over time. So let's start with treatment now. First thing, if a child is, is out of school especially, or is you may be home, but you're going to be on a regular school day schedule. We've got to establish the school day routine. Do you ask parents about this? A lot of times 
you get, well, what am I supposed to do? Police him? And in a way, it's like, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. There is something here to say. I mean, we do have parents who are working and stuff. There is a little bit, especially with kids who are a little older, where parents feel, well, she's 14, I could leave her at home, or 12 years old, you know, latchkey kid, I could leave him at home. You know, I want to put a little more burden back on mom and dad. So you'll see, I'm asking them, I don't care if it's, you know, a big shot Miami lawyer or if it's somebody who's working in an office, you know, as, as a secretary. Make space in your work area for him to go with you and sit. And you'll hear about this as we move along. Uh, there has to be a little bit more burden put back on the parents to get in and start working again. So school day routine is important for us to get on it. All right, And it's especially important when there's other kids in the house. Why does he get to sleep in? That's, you know, it's not fair. And you know what? It isn't. I align with those kids. It isn't. On a typical school day, um, we want to see that, uh, we want to outline with the parents and the teen, or the, the, school, the child, what a day would look like, what time would you get up, okay? Uh, 7.15, you're getting up. Uh, what would you be doing then? Do you shower? Do you do breakfast first? Or do you shower first? Or brush your teeth? How does it go? Do you need to make your bed? Or, you know, how does this work? I want it on a time schedule. I want to know all the way through. And then I want to know once you're at school, the bell rings, let's say, at 8.30. What's the first period? What's the second? I want to know what the day is supposed to look like for you. When do you get a snack at school? Or when you know, is your lunch break? OK? Because we are going to do this. This is going to be your day. And it's going to start with getting up doing what needs to be done, get ready to go, put the backpack on your back, and walk from your bedroom down to a boring place in the house that's going to be your place to sit through the day. OK? This is where, if someone stays home with that child, that person can't be warm, cuddly, I feel terrible for you person. We've got to turn that person into the sergeant at arms. There's no interaction with that child except as needed to give another assignment to to work on. You know, So we can't have a cuddly day at home. School has got to be more appealing than being at home. Yep. What if the child refuses? The child refuses. Well, we're going to be doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah. We're, we're going to get into that. Yeah. All right. The daytime routine, uh, what they'll be doing during the course of from, you know, starting at 8.30. Well, one of the things, like I said, I want that child as, as much as possible if no one's home. Um, the parent brings them to work with them, and they're assigned a boring task. But this means you got to tell the people who work with you not to talk to them, not to give them treats. This isn't like visiting mommy's office and getting, you know, uh, candy from the secretaries. And so, no, you're going, you're sitting at a table or at a space, and you are going to be either doing boring rote tasks for mom or dad, or you're going to be working on schoolwork that will be sent home to you from school. Um, you might have to bring the child to you know, younger kids, or depending upon the work situation, they might have to go to someone's house. But make it the person who is the least warm fuzzy you can find, who can handle this, and who will you know, say, OK, here's my kitchen table. You're sitting here. All right? Um, they receive no extra verbal or physical attention. There'll be a point where. The child gets a snack. There will be a point where they get lunch. you know. But um, they're supposed to do things like work on schoolwork or do chores for you. And every hour, here's the thing, you ask them, are you ready to go? You give them the opportunity to say, take me to school already. You know, I'm tired of scrubbing the toilets. You do. Give them the opportunity. Every hour, you're just a simple, would you like to go to school now? No. OK. And you keep at it, and you go back 
and back away from it. The thing is, this helps parents with the mindset that, well, if he missed getting there, there's no point in going in. Well, yes, there is. All right? You, you know, the school will welcome him at 2.10 as much as they'll welcome him at 8.15 because they want to be on your side to help him come in. All right, so the first thing you do is establish this daytime routine for the kids. Now, yeah, they're going to kick, moan, scream because they've been allowed to escape it. Now, there are different things that we, we can do here. With, you know, younger children, 12 and under, it, it's a little easier because when they start seeing you mean business, they whimper and cry, but a lot they'll, they comply for the most part. Even if it means sitting at that table and they eventually put their head down and, you, you know, when you find that they're sitting there sleeping, you know, you wake them up, come on, keep at it. Um, you got to, you, you know, there's no TV, there's no computer. And this is, you know, again, I mean, uh, if they need to use a computer for, for working, it makes sure it's a computer that is really pet protected password. They're not going on the web. They're not playing games. It is, you know, just for typing in an assignment type of thing. Um, the older kids are the ones who will give you more trouble, but that's where things like a day treatment program that has, now I don't know how it is here. Different places have mobile support units. If a kid's been out for six months to a year, New York, Pennsylvania, a couple of other places, you can, you can engage with the mobile support team that will send a behavior specialist. Nothing like that here, yeah. Okay. But then look, I would look and see what day treatment programs exist. Is University of Miami or, you know, do different programs have day treatment? Um, because it may be that that's where they should be uh, because they're going to be getting therapy plus most of these, when there's a day treatment program, there's a school component to it. Again, it's not going to approximate what they're missing. If the parent can't do this at home, right? Um, you know, and we have gotten, we have sent kids, you know, to residential when we've had to. Um, so as quickly as possible, though, you are changing the milieu at home and making things, even to the point where they're getting they're it, at all possible, I even have them not even be at home, they're, they're doing their school day at a local library. All right? So mom, and you know, and this is where, okay, you know, mom can sit there and read a novel or whoever's supervising them, but he's going to be at a library then. And this is where you want, if they refuse to go to the school, you make a, agreements using reinforcement that we'll be talking about as we move along later and, and more this afternoon. Uh, you have the tutors meet you at the library for the child, not at your home. As much as possible, they, you've got to get them up school day routine out of the house if possible so they're not there and they have the opportunity to try to escape to a room. I do have parents take locks off of doors so they can't barricade themselves into their rooms and stuff. Yep, we go that far. For, we go further, and we'll talk about that as we move along. Um, you know, but they've got to work on, and you are asking, and, and you're having the, the parents and working with them as you're working together with them in the school to get as much schoolwork as possible sent home to work with them to keep on top of it. One of the big kickers with school refusal is when the kids really fall behind, and especially when they're you know, then they lose the academic year. Then sets in the, I'm behind everyone, there's more embarrassment around that. Uh, they don't want to go back to school as a ninth grader yet again, things like that. So the focus here is on trying not to get that problem compounding the school refusal problem you already have. So you have to work very hard to, you know, get them academically more in line, which means, uh, again, meeting with teachers as soon as possible in the program that you're going to work with, meet as soon as possible after school hours or whatever to really get from the teacher, the teacher to start grading the kids' papers some and work with the kids and have some talking with the kids about things so that they feel that they're catching up and they actually are starting to catch up some. Um, and I will say this too. 
if you've been out for the school year, you're going to summer school because that's a good, you know, natural resource that you have from the public school systems and stuff to try to get this kid back into the routine of going to school. Yes, ma'am. In the afternoon, but I'm sure um, some people may be wondering, and I am, because kids who are in public school here, as we know, with response to intervention and all that, mm -hmm. has been delayed the process so much. How, what level of qualification would it be in uh, emotional uh, disability, you know, or what kind of? This is usually an emotionally or? disturbed okay. categorization from schools. Uh, school refusal for internalizing disorders like this is usually an ED classification. And to qualify for that, and I don't know if it's different here in Florida, would the child have to go through a whole testing and wait for all that? Well, I don't know. That's, yeah. you know, some places. Because it's an emergency. Well, do, do you have to do the testing in the school, or can the testing be in a private practitioner? It could be a but not really. I'm a chairperson for psych services in the district. So if we have a child like this and if they have a diagnosis, unfortunately, a lot of times they go to homebound. Right? There is homebound. They go to homebound services and they provide the tutoring. Oh, these are the people everybody calls. When you're in the school, you have to call those two. We get all these children. We get it. Okay, good. And for the can tutoring? Go, can you go to the house? We, we can go to the house. We can have the evaluation. Oh. We can go to the house to do the, uh, the tutoring. We cannot go to the house to do interventions. Okay. So that, then that's... So that's, you're the educational intervention. You're the educational intervention. That goes hand in hand with what the social workers and therapists are doing. If they are seeing social workers and therapists, mm -hmm. because all you need is a pediatrician to say, this is what you have, and you and can get, get our services. Yeah. And they may not have any outside treatment, because we cannot tell the parents, you have to get the child treatment in our well, we can suggest. We can suggest, but we cannot tell. So you can't. You, uh, right. So the kids may not be receiving any. We may. We may. Okay. So this is this is where. So okay. So we have a better sense of at least in Dade County or Dade County people. Um, so we have a better sense that there is a homebound uh, services if the child has a diagnosis and if they follow the steps to get this, where tutoring can occur and evaluation can occur too. Right. Yes. But. Um, but the thing then that what we're bringing up here is that for the parents to recognize this is a problem warranting intervention means that somehow they need education about what will happen to your child. First of all, that this doesn't spontaneously remit once your child is missing school. They're not, you know, parents have to be helped, and this is again, and grandparents and anyone around, they have to be helped to understand kids don't grow out of school refusal. They're not going to wake up next year in September, well, here in Florida in August, and say to themselves, I'm so glad it's a new school year, I'm getting into school. It doesn't happen. And they've got to understand that the children are being put further and further behind kids their age, which makes them feel even worse, and you know it, it interrupts and interferes with the ability to make friends. So you've got to do some psychoeducation somehow. Whoever's in schools, and then our homebound people, you know, we've got to do some psychoeducation that helps them start understanding they're not ever going to be leaving your home. I mean, I say to parents who are who who have kids who really are entrenched, and the parents who are like you know, not taking action. I go after them. Has any, any of you ever uh, heard of Albert Ellis? Mm -hmm. Okay, you ever see the way he used to work? He's long gone, not long, he's gone now, unfortunately. He's, he's a very direct, in-your-face New Yorker, or he was. Um, so my thing with the parents is a little more gentle, but I, you know, I work up to the point where I'll say, can you tell me about your medical history? Yours, not your son's. I want to know about your history. 
And, you know, father, well, you know, obviously I put a little weight on, I got hypertension, you know. Okay. Mom, what about you? Well, you know, I do have asthma all my life, and, you know, and, you know. So you're hearing about the history. Okay, look, are you really following a doctor's orders because, you know, I really need to know how long you're going to live? <laughs> no, I go there. And they're like, what do you mean? I, I really need to figure out what's your family history. When did your father die and mother die and what did they die of? I need to know how long you are going to live and make a prediction of that because we've got to figure out he's going to be supported by you for as long as you live. <laughs> and bear in mind, if he's not getting out now to learn how to have a job and to, you know, to finish school so he could get a job, learn how to go to the grocery store for himself and things like that. When you're gone, please have a lot of money there so he can hire <laughs> someone to do it. Now, I do this to parents and, they, you know, and they're like, you have no, you know, you're not understanding the, the gravity of this situation. He's not going to turn into a functioning person. So you have given birth to him, you're letting this happen, so you better be there until he's gone. You got to outlive your kid. Wow. Hey, wow. that shakes them up. It sh because it is the, you know, all of the things that you heard about earlier this morning. The consequences of this, they have to wrap their head around. They have to wrap their head around. And and yeah, you can make them upset. That's all right. Someone's got to make them realize what the stakes are for your child. And the other thing, you know, that we get to is that we want to help, and there are people who can help. Now, let's figure out you getting access to those people and how to do that. You know, so I don't know, within your means of what you're, you are allowed to do or whatever, at least to make suggestions, we can't, you can bring a horse to water, you can't make him drink. You, but you, you know, but these are kids, so we want to do as much as we can, and we want to try to motivate the parents as much as possible for this. Okay. <laughs> so, um, here's the second strategy, and maybe this is another place to get some leverage, is the second thing is we've got to get the parents and the school working together. <coughs> You know, I have all, I'm, I, you know, it's just, it's a matter of policy for me. I do not provide letters asking te uh, schools to change a child out of a teacher's class. Mm -hmm. How many of you all are old enough to remember the little rascals in the old days? There was Miss Crabtree <laughs> was the name of the teacher, okay? I don't care if it's Mr. Miss Crabtree or Sister Mary Elephant. Remember her from Cheech and Chong? I don't care who the teacher is and how mean that teacher is, um, you know, because here too, the, the parents are quick to blame the school and the school is quick to blame the parents. And we've got to, you know, as the therapist, I've got to be the advocate. I feel a lot of times like I'm working with a couple who's divorcing in a way and we've got to, you know, get them to look at what are your goals? What do you actually want? And they both want the kid to be okay in school. So stop the blame game. And with the parents, that means you can't choose the teacher the way you want to choose the teacher. Sometimes you have a little input, you know, can we have this class? But it doesn't matter if it's Miss Crabtree this year, Sister Mary Elephant did it next year. He's got to get used to different kinds of people through the course of his life. And that if you know, Sister Mary Elephant is screaming at the kids, you know, it's some kid acting up, and he's cowering. He's got to learn how to say, what am I cowering for? I'm okay. He's the one who's throwing spitballs, not me. Or if, or if the teacher's in a bad mood and everybody's getting it, okay, he's got to learn, whoa, what a day she's having. It's not me. You know, he's got to learn through the work that you'll do with him to coach himself differently in the course of the class. And parents have to learn that. And I say to them too, so what are you going to do? Choose his college professors? Are you going to choose his boss? When is this going to end? He's got to learn how to handle, you know, people of different personalities. But this means bringing them together and you've got to be a, you know, a mediator here. 
Um, that, and then I like to say, okay, look, there may have been a history here, different schools, and you've, the school has heard from the middle school and the elementary school, the things that went on there, and mom's sitting in the classroom and being the cafeteria lady and volunteering in the library and all the stuff that was done, <laughs> all of that, you know, but now we're in high school. And it's a different situation. You're not supposed to be here because kids don't want their parents around in high school and the schools don't want you here. The job is for the child to become independent over these four years. So with that, or even you know earlier on, whatever it is, we've got to get you all to stop blaming, recognize whatever <coughs> both of you were doing bef up to this point wasn't working. So now we have to come together with a plan. All right? So get them to bury the hatchets as, as it is. Um, and that has, has to be something. And usually that's in you. It starts with the therapist contacting the school officials. Um, and what you want to ask for is you want to show the school and you want the parents to be with you on this that we're working to get them back in, not to change your system. See, that's an important thing because the, the school is always having parents come in who want a smaller classroom or, you know, they want, to, they want him in a different school than the district that he's supposed to be in. And, you know, they are going all over the place. It's like, stop. It ain't happening. Let's start here now. So together we want to know what is required. First thing I always want to ask, what's going to be required to help this kid catch up to where he needs to be? Because that involves working with the tutors in a reasonable plan plus you know, any other kind of support at the school that's available in a resource room person, after school stuff that they can work with, with, you know, the math teacher holds an after school math thing. Maybe we have to figure it out. What are the resources available to get him or her back on track academically and be able to make up the work that could maybe save him that grade and not have to repeat it? Maybe he's only missing 20 days, but it's the assignments that are going to knock him out of being promoted. But he's a smart kid and he actually should be. Able OK, let's get it together. We also want to know, this is important to know, and to take a look at the pattern of what's missing. Maybe this kid has been doing the social studies homework, but not the math. That's where I'm like, wait a minute. Is there a math issue here? That's why testing is important and stuff. Because we need to know, is, do we need some kind of LD issue you know, to be evaluated and worked with? So this is important to find out what's going to get them back on track academically. I want the school to tell me, what are your goals? Right? And I want to know, what do people think of this kid? I want, you know, as much as possible, I'm asking the school counselor, uh, or the school uh, principal, whoever, you know, is the contact person for me. So what do you get in terms of talking to his teachers, to the peers? What, what do they say about him? Because we want to know that because if there are some real big biases, we've, we've got to have to figure out how to help that counselor in the school change that with the teachers, let's say, or something. You know, because kids and parents will contaminate things. They don't care to be burnt, especially the kids. I'll burn every bridge to be able not to have to go back to that school. No, we're going to repair the bridges, all right? Um, procedures and timelines for reintegrating into the school. This is where I need the school to buy in with me that it's not a week. It might not be three weeks. But I'm going to be working, and I need to ha be able to have access to making plans where he visits at different times, you know, according to our plan, and he gets, and he meets with teachers, and he meets you know, and he starts like attending a, the easier class. Maybe he goes to the resource room hour first and not goes into social studies. You know, but we've got to get this set up where I have access with the goal being he's in half the day within three weeks. He's in full days at the end of five weeks, let's say. You know, we, so we move along so that they're on the same page knowing these are the goals. And we're going to keep in contact. It's very important to try to have one main contact person at the school who's always going to work with you and the parents so that they're not shifted around to several different people because that upsets the whole apple cart again, right? Um, what are the obstacles? Transportation, help getting them out of the house, um, you know, inflexible educators, teachers who won't 
spend on something or, you know, so what are some of the obstacles we have to think about to help us along here and how can we work around them or help them to break down a few of their barriers to let things happen that need to happen? What other obstacles can you think of, especially my homebound people now? Stereotyping. Sorry? Stereotyping. 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 Stereotyping, yep, because then everybody's going to treat this kid in such a way that he's not going to be able to break out of it. Now, we're going to talk, you know, as we do the social phobia stuff in a little while about the kids and how to work with peers around that, but the teachers is an important thing. How do you get around that when there are school personnel who are looking at the child and they, you know, and they experience it in a negative way? In, the, in our system, we have, for kids that have behavior, difficulties, we have to create a behavior intervention plan. Mm -hmm. So the teachers are supposed to then implement that plan. So this is something that we work together with parents. Don't laugh. <laughs> with parents and teachers to create those plans. Yeah, so the thing here is that you work with a behavior intervention plan that involves input from teachers and parents. Right. Well, this is part of that getting everyone on the same page. And this is where, you know, as the therapist, I got to say, you know, look, I have to say, and you talk about, you know, we talked about billing, billing. I don't bill for phone calls. Oh my gosh, why don't I bill for phone calls? It takes a lot of work, spending time on the phone, talking with the school personnel and the parents and going back and forth, arranging conference calls with them at times if that's, you know, what works best to get everybody together. Um, it does take a lot of work. Uh, to get people on the same page on behalf of the child. And recognizing that teachers are tired and overburdened as it is. Right now in New York, I've got a program going on in a school that has something else. It has not, it's nothing to do with school refusal. It's a really fun thing, something different. But um, they're heading into their testing. They have tests at the end of April. And so we're engaged. Right now they're meeting about our project. I'm not there. And you know, my way of getting the me, our way of getting the teachers engaged is we're, we're meeting with them on their lunch break and we are bringing in food so that they don't have to make the extra steps around that and we are being as efficient as possible with them. We've done lesson plans for this project. We've done it all in advance, sent it to them so at their leisure over the last couple of weeks they could look at this and we could get their feedback without burdening them with writing something and, you know, and stuff, making it as easy as possible because that helps them to be more involved and buy in. So this, it, it doesn't matter if it's a project or one child. Any extra work you're giving the teachers, obviously, you know, you've got to think about what their, what their you know, level of burden is and, and work around that and validate it. Val let them know you understand, you know. Because um, it's more than, you know, it's not unlikely that they don't, that they have, they probably have two kids like this, plus then the ADHDs who don't refuse school, unfortunately, but disrupt the whole thing. <laughs> you know, they got a lot going on. Um, and then, you know, we have to also understand, and, and we already, you know, the past school refusal behavior and what it looked like. That is important because, you know, there's your stereotyping beginning of the school year, before the kids arrive at school, the, the teachers are having their meetings, they're going over who the kids are, and, you know, the fourth grade teacher looks at the fifth grade teacher who she's given a report on, the kids in her class, ugh, don't worry about Jonah, he'll only show up every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Your stereotyping is starting right off the bat, you know, so confirming, yeah, he's had a history of school refusal behavior. We're here to try to turn that around, all right? Um, we also want to know about just the general social, other behaviors of the child, how they interact in different situations, you know, in and around the school. I really want to know, you know, do they make themselves present in the social milieu? How do they take advantage of things or not? Um, what's been tried by the school personnel in and around, getting the kids involved and staying in that's worked or hasn't? Um, Again, I want to understand what a school looks like. And this is especially for kids who have generalized anxiety. A kid in Albany that I worked with, I'll never forget. He looked like, yeah, remember that movie, Private Benjamin? Mm -hmm. Do you, there, was a tr there was like a picture that had a picture of Goldie Hawn as Private Be Benjamin in the fatigues and all that with a huge pack on her back, you know, just looking like, oh my God. That's what this kid looked like. He had a backpack 
that you'd think you were sending him off, you know, you know, for a year's service somewhere in the world. He had everything in it. He had, he had scissors, calculators, sixth grader, scissors, calculator, multicolored pencils, crayons. It's like, what the heck are you doing? He had notebooks, he had all kinds of stuff in this, a hole puncher. What are you doing? And here was the point with him. And, and this was an interesting thing. He was having back problems. He put everything, he had so much in this backpack because he didn't want to use lock, his locker because it was too far, you know, to go back and forth to the locker and try to open the locker held him up. He got confused, he was upset, he'd be late for class, so he had everything in the darn backpack. Plus, um, you know, huh? Well, it's one solution. Yes, exactly. That was one way we could do this. Uh, you know, so anyway, you know, I want to know what the school layout looks like, especially when it's younger kids and transition kids who are transitioning to a new school or something, because you've got to understand how the layout is so that you understand what their frame of mind is about the layout. Kids who go from single teacher classes to changing classes, you know, change into a bigger school, all kinds of, you've got to understand that stuff because it feeds into what they are afraid of and, and you know, working with in, in that. So know that. Um, uh, disciplinary procedures and what are the procedures for contacting parents? Obviously, the kid I told you about earlier where the brother picked up the phone, she'd been out for over 20 days. I guess they didn't have much procedure until a certain, you know, number of days were hit. But you want to know about these things. This is very important. And, you know, how are they going to react to a child who's always out of his seat to ask to go to the nurse and things like that? You, you want to know, and what are the rules? I, I have a favorite patient that I've been working with for a number of years. He came to me as a school-refusing senior in high school due to separation anxiety, but he has pretty significant Asperger's. So that was really the main thing. And we started working together um, and got him to sporadically to be in school. This is a kid who is brilliant, brilliant, unbelievable. So he passed all tests, everything, he was able to graduate. And now he's in, a, in college in Long Island in like a mechanical engineering program. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, the school re <laughs> refusal has gone from the separation anxiety, I've got him convinced his mother's not going to run away from him, to uh, panic freezing. Uh, in terms of going to school. Um, and so just yesterday, I landed in Miami, and there, was email, there were emails and a text from him uh, saying, OK, I missed my physics lab, and it requires a note from the doctor. Uh, I am, I'm struggling with going to my next class. I'll get back to you on trying to use the skills you taught me. <laughs> And then another thing was, my mother's yelling at me, you better help me handle her. I don't know what to do with her. It's really a lovely, I love this family. So anyway, you know, with him, um, he, the rules about absenteeism for this particular physics class is, the, is that he has to have a doctor's note to have missed something. Now, I typically don't give them. So with him, with the, you know, his severe Asperger's and stuff, I mean, he's, he's you know, dependent on his family. He's not an independent college-age kid in any way like that. With him, I'm like, okay, in any semester, you're getting two absences with a note from me. But each note is going to, and I sent him what the note would look like. Each note will say, I expect he's going to work hard at this, and there will be no more than two, if, if that much. So that he's aware. He's using, now we're pretty good. This is March, and he's using the first. He's been in since January, so it's okay, all right. Uh, you know, but there's different things. You have to know what the rules are about and set it up with the kids. I mean, a lot of times when you get them back into the school, they have to, you know, you might need them to, to have a get out of class for 10 minutes free card that they can use. And literally, we make things like that, you know, where they can uh, go, just go up and put a card on the teacher's desk remove themselves to outside if they're having a panic attack, let's say, as a teenager or something, you know, get themselves together and they have 10 minutes to get back in. And that may be something for a kid you get back into school that's going to then decrease over the course of time that you have them in there.
question. So your work, you know, so there's a lot, especially up front, of getting parents in school on board. I don't know what to tell you with the parents who won't do this. I mean, you, you know, I, I see the frustration. I've been wondering about you two. Through the course of the morning, boy, they were making faces at me like no tomorrow. Now, of course, thank goodness I don't have social phobia, because I would be sitting up there thinking, what in the world? But now I get it. These are the people in the trenches who get to go into the homes and really work with the families and see the families who are not engaging around the issue to help the child. So I think the district should be giving you massages, of tick, you know, <laughs> certificates for a massage or a day no at a money. spa. No money. <laughs> What's his name? Scott Walker? What's his name up there in Albany? I'll, I mean, in Tallahassee. I'll call him. Rick Scott? I'll call him. Any of the homebound staff needs to have vouchers for massage. Pedicure, Manny Petties. There you go. So I get it. You, you know, they, they see really up front and close the struggle. And so you, you know, they have good, accurate empathy. First of all, with the parents, when, because you're confronting and you see what the child's looking like, but then also, you know, you get that, tr what we call the, well, not we, the dynamic people call the transference and counter-transference. You know, you don't know who to be madder with, the kid who's not going or the parent who's not helping. You know, and there are times your hands are tied. Uh-oh. Yeah? I wasn't sure, I wanted to understand that the, the home visitors, did you guys say that you were able to go to the home, you could provide like, the home, like a home tutoring type service, but you weren't allowed to do intervention, is that accurate? They do an assessment. Okay, so you can educate them, you can provide what they would otherwise be getting in the school, but you're not really for example, be able to implement what we're talking about here. We're the school system. We educate. <laughs> <laughs> David! You may. Well, I, no, I just want to clarify one thing. First of all, a lot of these children are, are regular ed students. Mm -hmm. sure. So they're regular education, they have a diagnosis, but they have never really been assessed. Mm -hmm. So they are not special education students who are then eligible for services. Okay? And when it, well, and then when it's homebound, it becomes very difficult because the services, and Isabel can help me, but the services are provided mostly in school. They have to be in school. So basically, I mean, we do have, the, usually in the homebound um, it, uh, program, they do receive, it is a teacher that comes out to the home and provides the educational services because our business, as Patricia said, is, um, is education. education. But, so your um, degrees are as teachers? Yeah. No, no, well, she's no, she's no, she's no. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, placement specialist. All right. But typically, the homebound services do not do, do, do not include related services that would be delivered Counseling. in in a um, school site. So okay. school site. So, Such as a service like return, like actions that would return the child to school. Right. That well, would not be okay. Well, this is an evaluate sometimes and to yeah. educational. Assessment. Evaluation. Is that right? Yeah. I guess what I, I guess what I'm here, here's what I'm really asking. What I'm really asking is, you guys are here. That's wonderful. <laughs> and would it be possible for you to take the things that are yes. being yeah. uh, yes. done here and actually use them to get children back into the school? Well, that's probably because I am the school psychologist. Yeah. And how many kids do we have right now? About 600, 700 kids. That might take a little while, but putting that aside. <laughs> 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 I'm a I do all the evaluation for all of the kids who are special education who need to be evaluated, all the kids we are trying to evaluate to make special education. So, again, so if we cloned you. About no, so if we took this portion of the video and sent it to Rick Scott. <laughs> And said, stop cutting funding to schools and to especially to these services. Okay, but all right, let's 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 just let's all right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Most of them are not typically internalizing, although they can. We do yeah. have 
a, a, a number of students that are participating, of, of course, but it is not typically the majority of the 600 are not um, students that would be poor refusal. But let me, let me, let's say this, and, and, you know, Dr. Reitman is, like, right on in that, you know, what's happening is whether the kids are there because there's been a medical condition, there's always some, you know, along with medical conditions when they're taken out of school, you still get behind, and there also are feelings about getting back in or feeling different than the other kids. That are the internalizing symptoms that go along with them. So we work with medically ill kids as well. You know, a, some of my kids in the school refusal programs we have, have have been out because of a medical issue, and then it's hard to get them back in. Whatever the reason, whatever's going on, you know, certainly there are system issues that are really broken. And to have one psychologist with 600 kids is, in, is incredible. It reminds me of the time when I used to work in substance abuse, and as one, I was a counselor, and I had 150 patients on my caseload, you know. So the thing of it is you're overburdened, you don't have much support, and you're sitting in front of a family who is not engaging with you to help the child. The question, I think, from Dr. Reitman was, what can you take from here in the way of in the short amount of time that you have with any given family, where can you find what we call the nugget for that family that hooks them into understanding why it's important to, be, to follow through and do more for your kid than, than give your, throw your hands up? And that's where, you know, looking at, the, looking at what the place looks like, looking at who's caring for the kids, looking at who's talking to you and who isn't, you know, and, tr and trying to work through and at least, I mean, I remember when I worked in Broward County, I had this huge binder of, and it was alphabetized of all different types of services, and I had just handouts in it where, you know, okay, you need a parent support group of this, where you need, you know, you've got to, a resource binder, you know, something to hand them, but also using the psychoeducation about school refusal and the consequences in some way and get them started in some way about, look, okay, he's home with you. Let's at least start doing the homework while he's home. I need you at least to be able to use what we're going to see in a little bit, some of the reinforcement to do the homework while he's home. Something to get them going and to test them to see if they could get on board a little bit with you. I know you can't do intervention, but, you know, parents might not even know how to do some of these things. Of, they might not even know how to start turning the problem around. And if you could at least hook in a little bit to get them going. All right. Um, and we can maybe talk at different breaks and stuff about some other ideas.